So our next guest probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, he's asked me to cut short his resume. It is so extensive, I had to cut a significant amount of his achievements off, but I'll be brief. So Trinity College Dublin awarded PhD Structure, Conduct and Performance in Irish Banking, was an economist consultant Central Bank of Ireland, nominated to attend the IMF Institute in Washington DC, was economic advisor to the Department of Industry and Commerce, professor of banking and financial services at University of Ulster, professor of banking and finance in the Michael Smurfett Graduate School of Business, and in more recent times published, researched, and broadcast extensively in the fields of banking, financial services, including regulation, governance, and ethics, and his most recent book, which comes out at the end of this month, Troikonomics, Austerity, Autonomy, Existential Crisis in the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Ray Kinsella. Huge respect for them both, and it's just so good to be here with them. Um, secondly, I'm speaking um, as of no political affiliations. I'm speaking as an independent economist, um, just to share some ideas uh, that may be relevant to the times that are in it. Okay, our starting point, I think, is this. Official Ireland has made the European Union the custodian of our national interests and the trustee of the aspirations of our people. It has very largely ceded to the EU responsibilities for Brexit negotiations and our future relationship with the UK, our nearest neighbour and our largest single country trading partner. For a country with such a distinctive cultural heritage, going back thousands of years, but which attained its independence less than a hundred years ago, to cede those responsibilities is a very big deal. In the globalised and interdependent world, and all the good stuff of trading with each other, and uh, different types of cooperation. I mean, they're important, they're really important in trade because they're not just about welfare, they're about the affirmation of who we are and what we can contribute as a nation. But reflect on this. Who exactly are we ceding responsibility to? What kind of ideological mindset and governance is it that we're transferring our aspirations, our identity as a nation, our hopes, the future of our kids? Who are we transferring this to and why? The foundational vision of Europe, and I think it's important to say this, you know, this is not about negativity. It's not about ne ne negativity. It's important to recognize the foundational vision of Europe and what its accomplishments are, and the good people who have worked to make it happen. But what's clear to me and to colleagues with whom I've worked, many of whom you know, is that there have been structural and operational deficiencies that have become increasingly evident in recent years. And these deficiencies, and I've mentioned in particular the great uh, Anthony Cochran, and I'm so pleased to see his book outside because Anthony really has been a pioneer. What we're looking at are imbalances in the way Europe's developed, inequalities from the north to the south, and I'll come back to that, and asymmetries, the burden of adjustment to difficult times, and how unevenly that's been spread. And that argued that there was a compelling case for exit, 
I said it in 2013, in 2014 I suggested that Britain would leave by 2017. I was out for a year at being so, and that we needed to look to our own interests uh, in that situation. And of course, last August, I set out a case very fully in the Irish Times about why I thought, look, we really got to talk about, um, we got to talk about exit. Um, but I would, I would like to say that in making the main point, which is that, and I'll talk about it later, Europe has changed. We need to recognise that so have we. And in the discussions that will be here later today, a degree of humility is always a good thing in economics. It keeps you grounded. Let me say this, the unified stance uh, on Brexit in Europe reflects or covers over really a divided Europe, a divided north to south, east to west, divided in terms of equalities and governments. And it's being held in check of what I believe is a previous fallacy looking at all of the stuff going on about the Brexit negotiations, and it's this. If you, if you ease up, if you're not repressive, then they'll all be doing it. That's the kind of mindset that there is in Europe, and it does no favours to Europe or to the need for cooperation in our times. Um, and my colleagues will speak later of hard Brexits and soft Brexits, um, Norwegian deals and backstops and all the rest of it. But the key point I want to emphasize here is this. In my view, Britain is leaving, not Europe, it's leaving what Europe has become. And what Europe has become is a hegemonistic and increasingly militarized political behemoth. And that really worries me the increased emphasis on militarization, and it should worry everybody here. It's become hegemonistic, it's become militarized, it's largely controlled by Germany, and to a greater extent by the Franco-German axis. This Europe is not a community. It's discarded its foundational Christian democratic roots that were at the heart of the European project. It's bound together by an oppressive dependency on the centre. Even the largest countries, other than those at the centre, play in the reserves. So the risks of trading, the risks of trading the approval of this particular Europe for the sovereignty and long-term interests of Ireland, our country, are enormous. Let me just say why and what kind of Europe I'm talking about. When I was a callow young economist, just knocking on the door of the Central Bank, which we joined in 72, I remember the excitement. I remember the real excitement and the positivity. That changed. It changed by the late 70s and the early 1980s. There was a shift in the ideology of what's called the West. And yeah, take a minute with this, but I think it's really important. If you want to go somewhere, you really need to know where you've come from and what has impelled you to move in that direction. Oh, in the, what would be, 78, the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn stood in the assembly hall at Harvard University giving the commencement address. And even later, the greatness of that man his prophetic vision and what he went through in the gulags and what he gave testimony of. In his address, in his address he, he reflected on Europe and where Europe's thinking and governments and values had come from. And the big point he made was this, that as he put it himself, we turned our backs on the spirit and embraced all that is material 
with excessive and unwarranted zeal. This new way of thinking, which had imposed on us its guidance, did not admit the existence of intrinsic evil in man. Think of crisis. Nor did it see any higher task than the attainment of happiness on earth. It based modern Western civilization on the road to worship man and his material needs. Now, here's the point. That's not what Schumann, it's not what Adenauer, it's not what the foundation of all this were inspired by at all. And this vision that was articulated by, and he deliberately chose Sergeant Nixon because of his moral stature, he was saying this in the late 70s. He was saying, things have changed and we're heading in a bad direction. In the early and mid 1980s, he said, what is this got to do with Europe? Well, Europe held a referendum, didn't it? It held a referendum to introduce a secular constitution. Pardon me. In effect, to crowd out all that Europe had been about, all that had been built on Europe. It's interesting, of course, when they had the referendum uh, and the secular vision had been pushed by France and the Netherlands, they, um, they failed. The referendum failed in France and it failed in the Netherlands and they basically pulled it. But they reintroduced it in the form of the Lisbon Treaty by the back door. We voted against the Lisbon Treaty, but that didn't really matter much because we, we voted again, didn't we? And we bought into the balls that were attached in the form of annexes on militarization and recognizing their neutral status. Really, when you look at it now, it was so much sad. And we fell for it. There have been further erosions, or we'll call them, of um, what Europe was about, uh, the macroeconomics of austerity, and I'm going to talk about that briefly, and the unprecedented migration crisis, and the attempt to <coughs> pass off what they dismiss the European elite as populism, to pass that off as some kind of right-wing reaction when it reflected the pain the deep-seated pain of what austerity imposed on Europe. At the heart of Europe is a flawed monetary system which imposes unfair adjustment on deficit countries and allows the surplus countries to prosper. The book that very Kate very kindly referred to there, and I'm not pushing the book. It's got a great title, but, and it means every word of it. We call it Troikonomics because the Troika took away not just the economic independence and capability of people, it took their governments. And there's uh, an Irish journalist, Lisa Handler, um, I quote her in it. Um, she describes what it was like to sit in government buildings and to watch the transfer of power, real power, from our government to the Troika. That was an existential moment. And actually, I did I say the book is co authored with my son, who's a philosopher, Dr. Michael Kinsley. Uh, Dr. Morris Kinsley, is it? Dr. Morris, Morris is, a, is a, a philosopher. And it was such a pleasure working with him because he was he specialized in the whole area of autonomy. What is it like to be oneself? And he transposes to what is it about a country that is special? And how can that feeling of specialness be affirmed? How can we determine our future in a way that reflects who we are and how we can become ourselves and others? Well, it wasn't that way in Ireland. It wasn't that way in Greece. 
priest ostensibly left the Troika or left the bailout a month or two ago. But when you look at the fine detail, when you look at a country that's been in the purgatory of austerity for eight years and experienced the emigration, the successive cuts in living standards, the inequalities, the feeling of hopelessness, and they're leaving, and you know what? They're leaving with a debt burden nearly as big. They're leaving with a requirement that they generate a positive balance of payments out of fiscal surplus every year, and that they will be evaluated for the next 40 years. I mean, what kind of exit is that? Now, I mention that only because I believe there is greatness in the European vision, but it lost the plot. Somewhere along the way, it lost the plot of what goodness and the Christian virtues that inspired the foundation of fathers. People like Adenauer. Uh, I mean, Adenauer rebuilt Germany. And in rebuilding Germany, he rebuilt Europe. But he was inspired by values that had effectively been discarded, crowded out by the new Europe. Have any of you uh, read the, the Paris Statement? And, no, I, I only ask it. For a second, I thought I was back in, in UCD. I only ask it. I only ask it because I swear to God, if you're here, you really should read it. It's um, by 13 European intellectuals and thinkers, people like uh, Roger Scruton from England. And it, it shows, it's pro-Europe in the sense that it says, Europe is great, but it's changed. The old Europe, what it calls the old Europe, Europe, has been discarded by what it calls a false Europe. A false Europe. And, um, a couple of the things that it says, and I think are worth quoting. It says, Europe was our home, but Europe is now going in a radically different direction. It has lost contact with where its values come from. It, is, it lauds these values, it says, these things are great. But it's lost the sense of where they came from. The false Europe is a dangerous place. We have no business, it seems to me, we who have had so much contact with Europe, being locked into a false Europe. <laughs> Think about this. The trauma of Brexit should have been the catalyst for reform. Instead, freed for the moment from the threat of populism generated by its own policies, the establishment pulled down the shutters on reform. It's heading in one direction, and that's, in effect, an empire, and beyond that, further supranational en 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 enlargement. Think about this, the core responsibility of any sovereign government is to protect the national interest. The essential ethos that lies at the heart of our sovereignty. Patriotism, properly understood, is an expression of respect for the unique national culture, the history, the values and the identity of a nation in its engagement with others. Bear this in mind too, that in what Brexit really means is Ireland, which shared a common stance with the UK on key issues. It's left marginalised, peripheral and dependent. Down the road, let me ask you, who will uphold and advocate Ireland's national interests within the supranational European Empire? Whatever the nature of what happens after Brexit, the governance of Europe, and whatever form it takes, really, we all know it, little consideration will be given to Ireland's needs and its capabilities. How could they be? 
of all issues that matter, the centre would advance its own agenda. Patriotism and values are being homogenised according to the recipe handed down by this false Europe. Amnesia is a terrible thing. It's prudent to remember that in the bailout negotiations, the European Central Bank cut the ground from underneath Ireland when we were at our most vulnerable. The head of mission, the former head of mission, the IMF head of mission, uh, recalls that it was the International Monetary Fund, not Europe, that it advocated against the harshness of the adjustment which the ECB attempted to impose and the pressure it imposed on Ireland to take and absorb the losses that should have been borne by the bondholders of delinquent banks. The threats, the threats of what would happen if Ireland didn't come to here were precisely that. They were oppressive threats. And it's worth going back to the, to the literature just to see their nature and the effect they had. They stopped the Minister for Finance on his way to the Doyle to announce reforms. Now, this is not about refighting old battles. It's not about that. We move on. But we really should learn. And we should learn that in a post-Brexit Europe, it would be unwise to depend upon the establishment to to vindicate our abilities and the abilities of our children and the three times in the last century Ireland remade itself. Extraordinary. So let me ask you, are Ireland's national interests, are they best served in a Europe such as that which has developed, which would do, which would fossilize basically Order. Or, alternatively, would the national interest be better served by a managed exit by Ireland? If so, what kind of arrangements would be necessary in relation to money and central banking? Um, in Yanis Varadkar's book, um, and I was at a session when he was speaking. Uh, do you know, when Greece went into the crisis, it was sensible to plan for the fact that it might be able to stay there. So he talked to his colleagues about saying, well, if you can't make it, um, we only need a currency. And he began planning it. But he found that he couldn't. He found it necessary to hack into his own department to get the systems and data which would enable them to have at least a safeguard. That is how oppressive the system was to Greece. Um, so we should bear that in mind. You know, I look at Ireland like all of us do today and uh, there are things that worry me. Um, I worry about the threat of militarization that is very real and very present. I worry about Ireland signing the PESCO declaration which commits us to spending hundreds of millions into the future on the arms industry and into research and development. Yeah, I worry about that. That is not what the founding fathers were about. <laughs> like us all, I suppose, uh, I worry about a third level that seems impervious to this. Why aren't they campaigning about this? Uh, I worry about um, how a government or a banking system that's sensitive to any kind of human emotions should allow foreign vulture funds 
to take ownership of them. I really do. That's not a bit of populist observation. Um, I had reason in the last two weeks to talk to someone to whom that happened. They were handed a dismissal notice by Vega. And I tell you, it's a very scary thing. How? How can that happen? Um, I want to be honest as well. I, I mourn for a country that celebrates legislation that facilitates the killing of infants. I, I, I mourn. Conscious of your kindness, and let me bring it to a uh, conclusion. We're dependent. We have left ourselves dependent on a Europe that has radically changed. I don't want to condemn that Europe, but I look at what the Paris Statement says, I look at great people from Adenauer to Solzhenitsyn. And I say, this is not what they were saying is worthy of, of worthy of our event. And I look at that dependency, and I say this, dependency is never healthy. It's never healthy in a couple. It's never healthy in a country. It's never healthy. It's never healthy in a political unit. We should not wear the yoke of that dependency. I look again at the times we have renewed and reanimated the cells. But I also say this, when I look at the changes in Ireland and I compare it to some of them, be humble because before we renew the country, we have to renew ourselves. Before we can be a light to Europe about a country that is sovereign and independent and that generously engages with others, we have to regain that ourselves. And incidentally, I read there's a couple of the guys here standing in elections in the next couple of weeks, and I really, you know, respect what they're doing and respect the stand they're taking for the, these values that we all find so important in our lives and in the lives of our children. God bless, and thank you for your attention.